Happy Sabbath, Church. Right, um, so for our today's health talk, we're going to be looking at air and fresh air and sleep. So why sleep is essential for health? Getting enough sleep is essential for helping a person maintain optimal health and well-being. When it comes to their health, sleep is as vital as regular exercise and eating a balanced diet. So benefits for sleeping. Number one, we have better memory and performance, lower weight gain risk, and better calorie regulation, and um, lower risk of heart disease. One risk of heart disease is high blood pressure. According to Centers of Disease Control and Prevention, getting adequate rest each night allows the body's blood, blood, blood pressure to regulate itself. Um, another benefit is a um, stronger immune system. Sleep helps the body to repair, regenerate, and recover. The immune system is no exception to this relationship. Um, so, how much sleep do we need? For infants, 12 to 16 hours, toddlers, 11 to 14 hours, school-aged, um, 9 to 12 hours, and teenagers, about 8 to 10 hours. For adults, 7 plus hours. So, um, tips for improving sleep. Avoiding sleep when you have sorry avoiding sleeping in when you have had enough sleep reducing stress through exercise therapy or other means and um now i'll be looking at air fresh air is good for our digestive system Fresh air increases the flow of oxygen, helping you to digest food more effectively. So this will particularly help if you're trying to lose weight. Fresh air helps improve blood pressure and heart rate. Avoid polluted environments, particularly if you need to improve your blood pressure. Stay away from busy traffic as the body will need to work harder to get the amount of oxygen it needs over polluted car fumes. Fresh air makes you happier. The more fresh air you get, the more oxygen you breathe, which will increase the amount of serotonin, the happy hormone you inhale, consequently making you happier. Fresh air strengthens your immune system. By increasing the amount of fresh air we get, we will increase the amount of oxygen, which helps our white blood cells to function properly by fighting and killing bacteria and germs. Fresh air cleans, uh, cleans your lungs. Your, li your lungs dilate more from having an increase of oxygen, so fresh air improves the cleansing of your lungs. Fresh air gives you more energy and a sharper mind. Um, that is it for our health talk. Thank you. I greet you all in the name of Jesus. I greet you all in the name of Jesus Christ. Uh, I would like to thank our visitors for gracing us today with your presence. We are very overjoyed to have you with us. Uh, for those visitors who have been attending with us all week, we are so grateful for your presence and we are honored by your presence. I would like to also welcome Pastor Chiriga, who has been one of my mentors. We were together at Grindle SDA Church when I was a young man. Uh, and I well remember those days uh, with my colleague, my colleagues, Taurai Mutefura the Late, Meg Kamanga, and we were being tutored and mentored by Pastor Chiriga. So welcome, Pastor Chiriga. Pastor Chiriga is going to have special prayers with us today, as you have noticed. We've been advertising throughout the week um, with regards to those who feel they're experiencing something, they've received things from their relatives, they feel they're experiencing certain phenomena they cannot explain, 
They've doubled in the occult. They've touched things and done things they ought not to have done. And we've asked Pastor Chiriga to come and assist with special prayer. And at the end of this service, we're going to have a special call for those who want to surrender and give up some of these things and paraphernalia. So without wasting much time, we're going to get into our topic for today. And we're going to cover much ground, much territory from Scripture. So I'm going to ask you to put on your thinking caps because we'll be reading many, many a scripture. And today's topic is going to be the occult and the spirit of prophecy. The occult and the spirit of prophecy. So I'd like to begin by broadly defining what the occult is. What is the occult? So the occult is defined as a belief or a practice of pseudo-sciences such as astrology, which pastor spoke about yesterday, magic, witchcraft, alchemy, theosophy, and spiritism. One thing you find in common with all these modes of, of the occult is that it designates an attempt to communicate with spiritual elements in order to benefit in some way from those spiritual elements. So all these modes of the occult have some form of teaching, some form of practice, some form of, 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 of doctrine that, that purports to enable humanity to communicate with the dead, to communicate with spiritual elements that cannot be seen, and to derive benefit from such spiritual elements. But this is not a new thing. It may appear to many of you that this is a new phenomena that has just arisen from nowhere. But if we look back in the Bible to the very beginning in the book of Genesis, we find that spiritualism was at play at the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Do you remember when Eve stood by the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and as she stood gazing by the tree, we are told that the serpent came and began to speak to her and to talk to her about the tree. Eve, from the moment she was created, had never seen an animal talking, but at that time she saw an animal talking and telling her about the benefits she can derive from disobeying God. So it is today. There are restless Eves. There are restless Adams who believe they can derive or they can achieve a higher plane or they can gain extra knowledge from a spiritual source or a spiritual element. And quite often they go to, to spiritual diviners, spoken of by pastor yesterday, who then give them insight into what is happening in the spiritual realm. And what does the Bible say to God's people with regards to this? Open your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 8, verse 19. Isaiah chapter 8, verse 19. Should we as God's people seek after diviners? Should we seek after wizards? Should we seek after witches? Should we seek after any, any individual or diviner who purports to speak to a spiritual element and derive benefit from them. Is this the way that God would want us to go? Isaiah chapter 8, verse 19. Right? The Bible reads, And when they shall say unto you, Seek unto them that have a familiar spirit, and unto wizards that keep and that matter, should not a people seek unto their God, for the living to the dead. Amen, church. So here in the book of Isaiah, in the book of Isaiah, we are being told that at the time that Isaiah lived, the children of Israel were, 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 were following the customs of the idolatrous nations around them, and instead of seeking the oracles of God, instead of seeking the, the will of God at the sanctuary, they were now going and looking for extra knowledge from wizards and those who peep and matter to get forbidden knowledge. And Isaiah was sent with a warning to the Israelites of that day, as we are warned today. 
And when they shall say unto you, Seek unto them that have familiar spirits, and unto wizards that peep and that matter, should not a people seek unto their God for the living unto the dead. So this problem has been there not only in our time, but it, is, it has been there from time immemorial, where people want extra power, extra knowledge from a spiritual element devoid from God. And this idea and this desire has crept into our mainstream. Our popular movies of today are based on this purported reception of power from a spiritual source. Some of the most popular movies out there, the Harry Potter series, the superhero movies that we watch, all the powers that those individuals exercise are schooling the world into believing that they can receive an extra source of power to do certain things. And because the world is beguiled by all these teachings, the world is beguiled by this phenomena, the world is beguiled by this desire to enter into knowledge they ought not to enter into, they have no appetite for sound doctrine. And the Apostle Paul warns about this at the end of time. He knows, he saw looking forward, he looked to our time and he realized a time was going to come when people would not endure sound, true doctrine because they will have imbibed the teachings of the world. Open your Bibles to 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 3 and 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 3 and 4. What has been the effect and the impact of this false teaching that has spread throughout the world? That many actors, musicians, politicians, and all these people out there are, are, are peddling to the populace. What is the effect of these false theories? Theories of evolution, theories of alchemy. What is the effect, the net effect, that Paul saw looking forward into our time? What would be the result of people going to seek knowledge from diviners? What would be the result of people going to seek knowledge from sources they ought not to go and seek knowledge from? What would the result be? 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 3. The Bible reads, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. Right. But after their own lust, shall they heap to themselves teachers, having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth. And Shall be, uh, Amen, church. Verse 3 says, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. The reason why we will not endure sound doctrine is that our minds, our frontal lobes, are loaded with error. When error has become what occupies your mind, when true sound doctrine hits you, you won't recognize it. And Paul was speaking to our time, and he noticed and said, there will come a time when people will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall heap unto themselves teachers. So not only will, will people fill their minds with error, they will look for teachers, or they will gravitate to teachers who will teach them and confirm them in error. He says, these teachers having itching ears, what does that mean? Itching ears means an insatiable curiosity for new things. They want new knowledge. They want a new experience. They want something different from the old. But if you look into the religion of the Bible, it says, seek ye the old paths, ask ye the old ways, for it therein is the ways of life. Amen, church? Now, Satan has not limited his attacks to those who are living out in the world. He has not limited his attacks to the woman or the mbuya in the village who goes to visit a diviner. He has not limited his attacks to those who believe that they can go to seances and speak to their dead relatives out there in Hollywood. He has not limited his attacks to the movies, the films, the music, the practices out there in the world. But one of the greatest victories that Satan has gained is that he has brought this spiritualistic thinking into the church. Satan has not limited his attacks to those who are out there in the world, 
but he has brought this thinking that you can benefit from a spiritual element into the church. And in order to bring spiritualistic thoughts, in order to bring false doctrines, in order to bring false teachings into the church, he has an agent, he has a messenger, who he, has, who he has been using for hundreds of years to bring error into the Christian world. This messenger was foretold by Paul in the book of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 9 and 10. Paul spoke about this messenger. He spoke about this agent who Satan has used to open the door to wrong teachings, wrong, wrong theology, wrong doctrines, and bring them into the mainstream church and up to today, many a Christian has followed doctrines that have emanated from Satan. Who is this agent? 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 9 and verse 10. Verse number 9. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan, with all the power and signs and lying wonders. Verse 10. And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness, in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth, that they may be saved. So here Paul is looking forward into the future. Future to the time in which he was living. And as he looked forward into the future, he saw that an element was going to come into the church, and this element was going to be a messenger, an apostle of Satan. This element was going to bring in theology and teaching contrary to the will of God. And he was going to use this agent to corrupt the Christian world. And from the time that this agent rose up, the Christian world has followed many a teaching that are contrary to the will of God. This is why he further warns in the book of 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 1, he further warns that when this agent has done its work, in the Christian world, when this agent has done its work among God, the God, people who believe in God, there, there will be a condition within the church which will be fearful for those at the end of time. Something is going to happen in church. Those spirits, those devils, those demons will no longer operate only in the world, but they will operate right here in church. First Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. Verse number one. Right. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter time some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and in doctrine of devils. Of devils. Did you capture that? Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. So there are doctrines that are within the Christian world. There are doctrines that are within the Christian church. There are doctrines that we have been following throughout our lives. Many of these doctrines have been introduced into church by devils. And why would Satan want false, false teaching? Why would Satan want you to believe error? Why would Satan want you to believe what is wrong? Why, what is his motive? What moves him to say demons go into the churches and teach them false doctrine? What moves him? What inspires him? Read John chapter 4, verse 23 and 24. Please put on your thinking caps and follow me. John chapter 4, verse 23 and 24. What motivates Satan? Why does he want you to follow error? John 4, verse 23 and 24. Verse number 23. Right. But the hour cometh, the now is, when true worshippers shall worship the Father in, in spirit, spirit and in truth. Capture that. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. The Father seeketh such to worship him. Verse 24. 24. God is spirit. God is a spirit. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in. Did you capture that, church? If you purport to be a worshiper of God, if you claim to worship God, 
God is looking for worshippers who worship him not according to their own ideas, not according to what they received from their pastor, not according to what they learned when they were a little child, not what they believed when they, what they learned in Sunday school, but he wants followers who will worship him in spirit and in truth. Amen, church? And so Satan knows that if he can deceive the Christian world into believing error, into believing lies, into believing falsehood, he knows that the Christian world can then not please God and they cannot enter into heaven. If you read Luke chapter 10, verse 25 and 26, a certain lawyer stood up and asked Jesus a question. A certain lawyer stood up and asked him a question. Read, Pastor, Luke chapter 10, verse 25. Verse number 25. Right? So what is Luke, Luke, 10, 10, Luke 10, verse 25. 25. Yes. Verse 25. And behold, the lawyer stood, stood up and tempted him, saying, saying Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Right? And what was the answer? So the lawyer stood up. The lawyer stood up and he asked Jesus a question to tempt him. And the question was, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And here was Jesus' answer. Read verse 26. And he said unto him, What is written in the law? How readest thou? Amen, church. So the way to eternal life, the way to live forever with Jesus in heaven is not found in fingers. It's not found in the independent. It's not found in news and boon. It's found in what is written in the law. And the question is, how readest thou? Amen, church. So truth is not to be found in the dogma of your church. Truth is not to be found in the doctrine that you have received from a young child. Truth is to be found in what is written in the law. If you would inherit eternal life, you must compare everything you practice, everything you believe, everything you hold according to the standard of God's word. Amen, church. Jesus says in John 5, 39, search the scriptures, for it is in them that you think you have eternal life. For they are they which testify of me. Without the scriptures as the basis of what you practice, without the scriptures as the basis of what you believe, there is no eternal life that you can receive. Are you following me, church? Amen. So we must compare every doctrine. Because now we have known, now we have seen that Satan has brought false doctrine into the church. It is the duty of every Christian to compare whatsoever they believe according to the word of God. Amen, church? Amen. Isaiah 8, verse 20. Isaiah 8, verse 20. And when you compare what you believe with the word of God, there is action required of you to align yourself with what God has said. What is that action? Isaiah chapter 8, verse 20. Isaiah chapter 8, verse 20. To the law and to the testimony. Right. If they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. So to the law and to the testimony, to the teachings of your pastor, to the teachings of your priest, to the teachings of your teachers, if you compare them to the law and the testimony, if you compare them to God's word, and if they speak what is not in the word, there is no light in them. So the great standard upon which you ought to compare what you practice is God's word. Amen, church? Now, what are some of the doctrines of devils that have been introduced into the church? What are some of the teachings that Satan at the end of time has deceived the Christian world into believing and holding? Number one, Satan has led the Christian world into believing that the law of God, the Ten Commandments, have been done away with. And the verses that he has used, he has used Mark chapter 12, verse 30 and 31. Read Mark chapter 12, verse 30 and 31. The devil has led the world into believing that the law was nailed to the cross. 
There's no need for you to obey the Ten Commandments. All you need to do is love. If you have love in your heart, you are going to heaven. Read Mark chapter, chapter 12, verse 30. Verse number 30. Right? And thou shalt love the Lord thy God. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God. I'll with all thy heart. With all your heart. With all thy soul. With all your soul. With all thy mind. With all thy mind. With all thy strength. All thy strength. This is the first commandment. This is the first commandment. So, so there are two commandments according to this false teaching. Only two. The first one is love God. What's the second one? And the second is like, is, is like namely this. Right? Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. There is none other commandment greater than these. So the Christian world believes that there's no need for you to follow the Ten Commandments. Because Jesus has said you must just love. It's love that makes the world go around. Are you there, church? We used to sing it when we were young. All I need to do is just love with all my power and strength and might. As long as I love. What, why are you talking about the commandments? They were done away with. But what is love for God according to scripture? What does Jesus say? Read John chapter 14, verse 15. What is love? What is love? John 14, John, verse 15. John chapter 14, verse, verse 15, number 15. Right? If you love me, keep my commandments. So if you love Jesus, you shall keep his commandments. So there can be no love for God separate from the commandments of God. Amen, church? Amen. You cannot be put to love God through some feeling in your heart. I just feel I love God. That is not genuine love for God. The litmus test is that are you obeying the commandments of God? If you are obeying the commandments of God by the grace of Christ, you love God. Amen, church? So when Jesus says, you shall love the Lord thy God, with all your might and all thy strength and all thy mind and thy heart, what he's referring to is the first four commandments which relate to your relationship with God. Thou shalt have no other gods before you. Thou shalt not make any idols before you. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord in vain. Thou shalt remember the Sabbath to keep it holy. The first four commandments relate to your love with God. They relate to the relationship you have with God. And when you observe them by the grace of Christ, you love God. But it also says, thou shalt love thy neighbor. When you look at the last six commandments, they relate to one's relationship with their fellow man. Thou shalt obey thy parents, that the days upon the earth may be many. You are told that thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not bear false witness. Thou shalt not be covetous. All these six commandments relate to your relationship with your fellow human beings. Mm -hmm. So when Jesus says, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God, he's referring to the first four commandments. And when he says, Thou shalt love thy neighbor, he's referring to the last six commandments. And then he says, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. Are you there, church? Amen. So one of the doctrines that Satan has brought into the church is that you don't need the Ten Commandments. All you need is love, and that's all you need. But the Bible is clear. The law of God stands forever. If you read in Matthew chapter 5, verse 17, Jesus says, Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law. So the law, dear friends, is binding even in our time. What is the other doctrine that the devil has brought into the Christian world? The other doctrine he has brought into the Christian world is that the Sabbath is of no importance. All you, you need to do is to choose your own day to go and worship God and God will be happy with you. As long as you are praying and reading your Bible in church, you can, you can go to church on any day you like. That Sabbath thing is something that was introduced for the Jewish people. We are not Jews. So that is past and God done away with. We don't need to observe the Sabbath. It's for the Jews in Israel. Let's see what the Bible has to say about that. Genesis chapter 2, verse 1 to 3. And it's speaking about the seventh day. After God had made all creation, 
The Bible says he rested on the seventh day. And he did something to that particular day. Let's read Genesis chapter 2, verse 1 to 3. And someone hold Exodus chapter 20, verse 8 to 11. Verse Genesis chapter 2, verse 1 to 3. And Exodus chapter 20, verse 8 through to 11. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished. And all the host of them. And all the host, everything that God wanted to create was complete. And on the seventh day, God ended his work which he had made. So on the seventh day, God completed his work which he had made. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made. And he rested on a particular day called the seventh day. Come on. And God blessed the seventh day. And God, number one, blessed the seventh day. Sanctified it. Sanctified it, meaning he made it holy. Because that in it, he had rested from all his work which he had created and made. Amen, church. This was thousands of years before the appearance of a Jew. In the Garden of Eden, when God had completed his work of creation, he instituted the Sabbath to be observed by men. He rested on this day and he sanctified it, he blessed it, forevermore. And the Sabbath has been enjoined upon humanity to be observed even up to today. In the days of Moses, he reminded them that the Sabbath is still binding. Exodus chapter 20 verse 8 to 11. Verse number 8. Right. Remember the Sabbath day right. to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work. Thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, nor thy main servant, nor thy maid servant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made the heaven and the earth and the sea, and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the, seventh, the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Amen, church. So the Sabbath was instituted at creation. Thousands of years later, God reminded Moses that the Sabbath is still binding and it was put into the Ten Commandments. It was already there in the law of God, but it was reminded and written down for later generations that the Sabbath is still binding. The reason why the devil hates the Sabbath is because the Sabbath identifies who the Creator is. Remember when pastor said that in heaven, Satan rebelled against God, he rebelled against the authority of God, and he thought to put himself on the throne of God. But he was cast out of heaven because having been cast out of heaven, the reason he was cast out is that he could not occupy the position of God. And ever since he has been cast out, he has been fighting to dethrone God from the throne. He has been fighting to take the position of the creator. And the commandment regarding the Sabbath identifies who the creator is. And for many centuries, the devil has attacked the Sabbath commandment because he does not want people to know who the true creator of heaven and earth is. And to this day, he has attacked this commandment and he has made it of none effect among Christianity. Was the Sabbath kept by Jesus and his disciples? If you read Luke chapter 4, verse 16, Luke chapter 4, verse 16, did Jesus, during his ministry, keep the Sabbath? Luke chapter 4, verse 16. We are trying to identify some of the doctrines of devils that have crept into the church that have led many to think that they are worshipping God, but they are not worshipping him in spirit and in truth. Because God wants people who worship him in spirit and in truth. What are some of these laws? What are some of these doctrines? We have said one of the doctrines is that the law has been done away with. The other doctrine of devils is that the Sabbath is not binding. But we have seen already in scripture that the law of God stands forever. We have seen in scripture that the Sabbath still stands to today. And now we want to look and see, did Jesus in his ministry keep the Sabbath? Luke chapter 4 verse 16 and hold Acts chapter 13 verse 13 and 14. Luke chapter 4 verse 16. Verse 16. And he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. 
And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. So as his custom was, as his habit was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. So he's speaking about Jesus during his earthly ministry, and we are told here that during his earthly ministry, he had a habit of going to church on the Sabbath day. So there are many who say, I follow Jesus wheresoever he goes. Jesus in his lifetime on earth kept the Sabbath. How about the apostles? Because there are many who believe that the Sabbath with the law was nailed to the cross. There was no need to observe the Sabbath after Jesus had died and resurrected and gone to heaven. So did the, did the, did the apostles follow this kind of teaching or they actually observed the Sabbath long after Jesus had ascended? Acts chapter 13, verse 18. Verse number 13. Now when, when Paul and his company lose from Paphos, they came to Pega in Pamphylia, and John departed from them and returned to Jerusalem. But when they departed from Pega, they came to Antioch in Pisidia and went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and sat down. Amen, church. So even the Apostle Paul, whom many hold as their teacher, went to church on the Sabbath day. Amen, church. So the Sabbath, dear friends, was kept by the apostles. Will the Sabbath be kept in the new heaven and the new earth after Jesus comes? Read Isaiah chapter 66, verse 22. Isaiah chapter 66, verse 22. Will the Sabbath still be binding forevermore as a memorial that God is the creator of heaven and earth? Isaiah 66, verse 22 and 23. Verse 22. For as the new heavens and the new earth, which I will make, shall remain before me, saith the Lord. Right. So shall your seed and your name remain. And it will come to pass uh -huh. that from one new moon to another, from, from one, one Sabbath, Sabbath to another, shall all flesh come to worship before, before me, saith the Lord. the Lord. Amen, church. So even in the new heaven and the new earth, that God shall create at the end of time, we are told that those who worship God, those who shall be redeemed, shall go and worship God from one new moon to the next on the Sabbath. So the Sabbath, dear friends, despite what you have been taught by teachers, despite what you have been taught by priests, despite what you have been taught by pastors, is still binding up to today and shall be binding forevermore. What is the other doctrine? of devils that has crept into the church. Let's read Mark chapter 16, verse 15 and verse 16. And someone hold Ephesians chapter 4, verse 4 and 5. Mark chapter 16, verse 15 and 16. We are looking at some of the doctrines of devils that have crept into the church, that have made God's people believe they are following God, but in reality they are not following God. We have looked at the doctrine of devils that says the law is no longer binding, and we've refuted it. We have looked at the doctrine of devils that says the Sabbath is no longer binding, and we've refuted it according to the testimony. Now we're looking at another right, another doctrine that has been perverted by the wicked one to ensure that God's people are not worshipping him in spirit and in truth. Read Mark chapter 16, verse 15 and 16. Verse 15. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world, and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. Amen, church. Jesus, when he gave the Great Commission, one of the stipulations that he gave to his followers was that he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Now, this is one of the doctrines that the devil has perverted even to our time. Because the question is, how should an individual be baptized? There are some churches who believe that if you are to be baptized, they will crack an egg on your forehead, water. There are some churches that believe 
that in order to be baptized, you need to walk under a flag. Then you're baptized. There are some churches that believe that you need to walk on hot coals and be burnt under the soles of your feet. And if you endure the test, you're baptized. There are some churches that believe that if you have a cup and you throw the cup at someone's face, then they're baptized. There are some who believe that if you have a teaspoon and get a bit of water and put it on someone's forehead, that individual has been baptized. Now, with all these forms of baptisms, which form is the true baptism? How many types of baptisms are there in the world that God approves of? Ephesians chapter 4, verse 4 and 5. How many baptisms are there? Can I be baptized anyhow? Can I be baptized the way I want? Can I be baptized with a cup of water? Can I be baptized with a teaspoon of water? Can I be baptized under a flag? What? How many types of baptisms are out there that God approves of? Ephesians chapter 4, verse 4 and 5. We're verse looking four, verse four. and debunking doctrines of devils. Verse 4. There is one body, one spirit, even as ye are called into the hope of your calling. Right. One Lord, one faith, one, one baptism. baptism. Amen, church. How many baptisms? How many baptisms? One baptism. So there are not many methods of baptism. You cannot wake up and concoct your own way to baptize people. There is one baptism. Now we need to look to the law. We need to look to the Bible to look at examples of how people were baptized to know the method that God approves of baptism. And it's critically important that you know the method God approves because the Bible says, he that believes and is baptized shall be saved. Your salvation is at stake. Open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 3, verse 16, and someone hold Acts chapter 8, verse 35 to 38. Matthew chapter 3, verse 16. We're looking at how Jesus was baptized. We want to identify the one method of baptism that the Bible is talking about. Matthew verse, chapter verse 16. 3, verse 16. And Jesus when he was baptized, went up straight away out, out of, of the water. The water. May pause there. And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straight away out of the water. Amen, church. For Jesus to come out of the water, he had to have gone into the water. I follow, church. Amen. So, whatever form of baptism you subscribe to, you must have a way of getting inside water and coming outside water. Amen, church. Let's look at Acts chapter 8, verse 35 to 38. This is a story I'll give a background. This is the story of Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. The Ethiopian eunuch had visited Jerusalem on a pilgrimage. And as he was leaving Jerusalem, he was reading a portion of the book of Isaiah that he could not understand. And the spirit spoke to Philip and said, Philip, go and explain to him the scriptures that he's reading. And Philip ran and he caught up with the chariot of this man, this Ethiopian eunuch. And he began to explain to him the scriptures. And we catch the story in verse 35. Verse 35 to 38. Verse 35. Right? Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture, and preached unto him Jesus. And as they went on their way, they came unto a certain water. And the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? Right, so was this water a cup? Was this water a fountain? Was this water a dish? Was this water a spoon? Let's identify. Read the next verses. 37. And Philip said, if thou believest with all thine heart. Remember when Jesus said, go about and preach and those who believe and are baptized. So the eunuch has met one of the conditions. Continue. If thou, if thou believe, believest with all thine, thine heart, heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I, I believe, believe that, that Jesus, Jesus Christ is, is the, the son, son of God. God. has met the first condition. He believes. And the second condition and he commanded the chariot to stand still. 
And they went, do- they went down both into, into the water, water both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized. baptized. Amen, church. For Philip and the eunuch to get both of them into the water, would this water be a dish? Yes or no? Come on, church. No. Could this water be a cup? Yes or no, church? No. Could this water be a spoon? Yes or no, church? No. For both Philip and the eunuch to fit into the water, it must have been a great body of water that would enable them to be submerged like Jesus was submerged in the earth when he died and to be resurrected out of the water like Jesus resurrected on the first day of the week. Amen, church? Amen. So whatever form of baptism you subscribe to, I don't care what you subscribe to, as long as there is much water and you and whoever is baptizing you can get into the water. Amen, church? Amen. So eggs and flags and spoons and cups are doctrines of devils. Are you following me, church? Amen. I saw, I'm sorry I have to say it. Your eternal life is at stake. What are some of the teachings and doctrines of devils that have crept into the Christian world? The issue regarding the state of the dead in the judgment. We spoke about the state of the dead on Monday. And we spoke and understood that when a person dies, they are dead indeed. But the devil has been pushing an agenda. He has been pushing a teaching that when you die, you are not really dead. And this teaching has been teaching from the Garden of Eden when he lied to Eve and said, you shall not surely die. So from that time coming forward, people believe that you can die physically, but you have a spirit that is hovering somewhere, and that spirit can actually go to heaven and praise God. Amen, church. But we saw on Monday that that too is a doctrine of devils. And feeding from that doctrine Feeding from that wrong teaching is the idea that people can enter heaven as soon as they die. As soon as you die, according to this false teaching, you are now in heaven. And the way you get into heaven, for some of them, is you get to the pearly gates. And in the pearly gates, you are going to find Peter. Who many believe as the key of heaven and earth? Are you there, church? Because they wrongly interpret what Jesus said when he said, upon this rock I will build my kingdom. They believe that rock symbolized Peter, but they they wrongly believe that. Because we know that the rock of ages is Jesus. And when Jesus said, upon this rock I will build my kingdom, he was speaking of himself. But there are many people who believe that rock is Peter. So Peter will be standing at the pearly gates. And my Abazari, when you get to heaven after your death, you get to the gates and Peter will give you a riddle. One plus one. If you say two, then the gates of heaven are open for you. Are you there, church? Satan, by this wrong doctrine, has made heaven cheap. Are you there, church? This heaven that many have died for has been made cheap by doctrines of devils. And it removes the idea that people need to go through a judgment process before they enter heaven. Amen, church? You don't enter heaven. You see, so, so, so with this wrong teaching of devils, anyone who dies a thief, a murderer, an adulterer, a covetous person, a cheater, that person, if they die, they go to heaven immediately. They get a silly test at the gates of heaven and they enter heaven. So what the devil has done is he has made it appear that you can get to heaven in your sins. Are you there, church? But the Bible, the law, and the testimony make it very clear that before you can gain access to heaven, you must go through a process of judgment. Let's read Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 13 and 14. We are debunking these doctrines of devils. The law of God still stands up to today. The Sabbath still stands up to today. True baptism of immersion still stands up to today. 
Compare what you have been practicing at home. Compare what you have believed all your life according to the law and to the testimony. If whatever you are doing does not match what the Bible says, there is no light in it. Let's look at what the Bible says about the conditions of entry into heaven. Read Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 13 and 14. And someone hold James chapter 2, verse 10 to 12. Verse 13. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Right. Fear God. Fear God. And keep his commandments. And keep his commandments. For this is the whole duty For of man. this is the whole duty of man. Can you see that that issue of keeping the commandments has come back again? Verse 18. Verse 14. Verse 14. For God shall bring every work into judgment. For God shall bring every work into judgment. With every secret thing. With every secret thing. Whether it be good or whether it be evil. Amen, church. Before entry into heaven, all humanity who shall enter heaven must go through a process of judgment. And we are told by the wise men that in order to be ready for the judgment, you need to fear God and you need to keep his commandments. If your name comes up in the judgment and you have not lived a life of the fear and respect and honor of God and you have not kept his commandments, you cannot be ready for the judgment. Let's read James chapter 2, verse 10 to 12. What is the standard? What is the basis that shall be used to judge every secret thing and every work of a man's heart? What shall be used as the standard in the judgment? Because wherever there is judgment, there must be a law. Let's read it in James chapter 2, verse 10 to 12. For who keep the whole law? So do not kill. Now if thou commit no adultery, thou art become a transgressor of the law. Right? So speak ye, and so do as they that, that shall be judged by the law of liberty. Amen, church. When your name comes up in review in the judgment, when your name comes up in review during that great work, the standard that shall be used to judge your work, your thoughts, your deeds, your words, whatever it is, what shall be used to judge as the standard is the law of God. Amen, church. So when Satan says the law is done away with, what in essence he is doing, he is ensuring that you are not ready for the judgment. When we're in all level, there are many people who could come up to the examination time without being prepared. And when they would come up without being prepared, I don't know what happened in years after us, but there was a certain book called The Red Spot. Do you remember that book? Do you remember that? It tells me how old you are. Because I know it changed to become a green spot and a purple spot. Red spot. So you could come to the time of the examination not knowing anything, and then within one week, you can just get a red spot, do all the past papers, pass the exam, and get an A. Are you there, church? Not so when it comes with the judgment. Amen, church? Unless you look at the law of liberty and live a life in accordance with the law of liberty, you cannot pass heaven's exam. Amen, church? Amen. So, our topic said the occult and the spirit of prophecy. Satan hates those who keep God's law. Satan hates those who observe God's commandments. He hates those who worship God in spirit and in truth. His aim is to ensure that everyone is lost and no one is saved. And we're told in the book of Revelation that a certain time is going to come when the devil is going to attack those who keep God's commandments, those who worship God in spirit and in truth. Read Revelation chapter 12, verse 17, and just touch Revelation chapter 19, verse 10. 
Oh, just Revelation chapter 12, verse 17. Verse 17. We'll summarize the other. And the dragon was wroth with the woman. The dragon is Satan. We learned that when pastor spoke the previous day. The dragon represents Satan, the devil. And, right? And went to make war. I'll, I'll take it again. Right. And the dragon was wroth with the woman. Right. And went to make war with the remnant of her seed. Right. Which keep the commandments of God and they have the testimony, testimony of, of Jesus. Jesus Christ. Amen, church. So this verse is saying, and it's speaking about a time, when Satan shall be wroth with the woman. Now in prophecy, a woman symbolizes the church. Now it says that dragon Satan was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remainder of a seed. In other words, those followers of God who are living at the end of time. And it says, as an identifying mark of those who are the followers of God, who Satan will attack at the end of time. Here is the identifying mark. It says, these are they which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. In Revelation chapter 19, verse 10, we are told what the testimony of Jesus Christ is. And we are told that it is the spirit of prophecy. Amen, church. So one of the identifying marks of God's end time people, God's people who shall be faithful until Jesus comes, is that they keep the commandments of God, they have the testimony of Jesus, which is the spirit of prophecy. Dear friends, what does the spirit of prophecy tell us about future events? It tells us that a time is going to come when mercy is no longer going to plead for humanity. Grace is not going to be there for you, dear friend, forevermore. A time is coming when Jesus shall no longer plead for your sins. A time is coming when Jesus shall no longer kneel before God pleading for your sins. When you confess your sins, right now when you confess your sins, Jesus pleads his blood and your sins are erased. But a time is coming when Jesus shall stand up from before the throne of God and he shall exit the presence of God. And when he does that, those who are righteous will remain righteous. And those who are unjust will remain unjust. And those who are evil will remain evil. You don't want to come to that time unprepared. And the Bible says there shall be a great time of trouble. When Jesus removes his mercy from planet earth, when it's too late for you to be saved, the Bible says Jesus is going to withdraw his spirit from planet Earth and demonic elements are going to cause mayhem and havoc upon planet Earth. There shall be disasters and earthquakes of great magnitude. There shall be deaths on land and at sea of great magnitude. There shall be fires that will destroy whole cities in one day. When Jesus removes his spirit, there shall be so many disasters and death and destruction of property on planet earth that all the leaders of the world are going to unite and say, who is causing all this? And under the leadership of Satan, they are going to point a finger at those who are worshiping God in spirit and in truth. Are you there, church? That time is just upon us. And as the crowning act in this drama, Satan will impersonate Jesus. He will come in the exact image of Jesus as described in Revelation chapter 1. His face shining like the sun. His garments white as snow. His feet burning like brass. Satan will come like Jesus according to Revelation chapter 1. And he will deceive the whole world and say, those people who are obeying the law of God, those people who are keeping the Sabbath, those people who were baptized the right way, those people who believed in the judgment, those people who believed in the true state of the dead, those people are against me, your savior. I am now commanding you to go and destroy them. And as the wicked ones come to destroy God's people, it is at that very time that Jesus appears in the eastern sky to save his children. Dear friends, 
Jesus says in the book of Matthew chapter 7, verse 18, Enter in at the straight gate. For wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth unto destruction. And many there be which go thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. What this verse is saying, when it says, enter in at the straight gate, the word straight is not a straight, is the word used as in straight, as in a straight line. The word straight is S-T-R-A-I-T, which means difficult, which means austere, which means hard, which means that the way to heaven is not as easy as Satan would have you make you think or make you think. Satan would have you think that the way to heaven is, is lined by anything goes. If you believe anything, if you do anything, if you walk according to your own teachings, you can still enter heaven. But the Bible is clear that unless you obey the law of God and live according to his instructions, there is no heaven for you. So for those who are here, dear friends, and for those who are listening at home, the time has come that you must make a stand. Are you going to continue following the teachings of many a year that are contrary to God's word? Or are you going to make a decided stand on the side of Jesus? So as the chorus comes forward, and as Pastor Chiriga comes forward, I'm going to make an appeal, and our elders come forward. There are those amongst us who are saying, I need deliverance. Number one, I have doubled in the occult. I have followed wrong doctrines. I have followed wrong teachings. I have followed error all my life. And today, I want to make a stand for Jesus. Group number one. Then there are those who are saying, I have heeded the call regarding the surrender of things that I received from my parents. There are things I received from my grandparents. There are things that I doubled in on my own. But today, because of the deliverance session today, I need special prayer. There are, there are things I'm experiencing in my life that I cannot understand. There are things I'm experiencing in my life that don't make sense to me. I feel that I, I'm under a curse which I cannot explain. If you are there and you're saying, Lord, I need special prayer. I'm going to ask you to stand up on your feet. In fact, I'll ask the church to stand up on their feet. But those who are saying, I need special prayer. You may be an Adventist for many a year. You may be worshipping in another denomination. But you're saying, no, 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 Lord. I have learned the truth about your requirements for entry into heaven. And today, I want to make a decided stand for Jesus. If you are there, I'm going to ask you, those who are making that decision, to come forward and we'll pray for you with the elders. Those who are saying, I have been an Adventist for many a year, and I have backslidden. I have touched the unclean thing. This week has taught me that the true state of the dead is that they are dead indeed. This week has taught me that some of the things and the practices that I was now handling and getting into are not right. They have opened the door for spirits to influence my life. If you are there, feel free to come forward and our elders will pray for you. I will hand over to Pastor Chibalama. Pastor Chiriga. As we see, I request to those who need special prayers to come forward. Yeah. 
the singing said, Unless they want to keep the seed, they keep it in vain. If God is not there, I call those words I want to say to you. No one is safe in this world. Unless Christ abides in your life, you are not safe. I've seen people who have been troubled by demons just by playing with their cell phones. And uh, your mom and dad think you are in your spare bedroom when you are entertaining devils. Mermaids, spirits, in all forms. Some people have dreams, strange dreams. Sleeping with women, sleeping with men, in a dream, only to wake up to be sure it was not a mere dream, even though it's not a good dream. There are people who hear voices, strange voices, while they're walking in the streets. You are alone or with others, but you hear strange voices. Some of our children have been given things at school, and they have been troubled by some unknown headaches. That even medical doctors like you fail to detect what is this. No one is safe unless you are in Jesus. Is there no one else who needs a special prayer? I will invite you even to come up front so that we can pray to you. Paul, when he was writing to the Hebrews, said, according to the law, there shall be no redemption unless there is the spilling of blood. Whatever you may be going through, sin or experience, it needs blood. Not the blood of God's bulls, chickens, and animals. Not even human blood, but the blood of Jesus Christ. That is the only blood that can cleanse the history of a spiritualized life. And they begin on a new page where you can walk safely with and in the hands of Christ. Is there no one else, someone who wants to come up and so we can pray for him and we can pray together. I will ask you, Pastor Chabala, to read us Acts chapter 26, verse number 18 as you are about to pray. Verse 18. You know, I, I, I've learned something uh, that many people don't understand. When an invitation to come to Christ is offered, it's a rare opportunity. You struggle along in the byways of life. And you meet these things. Many think they are safe, they are well. And yet there are many demons who are just silent and yet still in you. They have not manifested in any way. 
but does not mean that they are not there. They are there. Unless a life is surrendered to Christ, then you are safe. And I also know it's a miracle for someone to move up from like she has done. For the devil also not allow him. But those who know personally that my life is in danger, who know personally that I have tears of the night, who know personally my family, my tribe, and my clan, they indulge in things. Never you think that when others are indulging, you are safe. Never you think. The law of the devil is that when they indulge to the diviners, as the preacher was saying, every name of the family is brought here. Those who are present and those who are not. Only those who are in Christ are saved. You may think you are coming to church and everything is fine. The devil knows all the gates to the church and knows the genuine in the church. When an opportunity is offered for someone to surrender his life to Jesus, for God to be allowed into life, it's a great opportunity. I want to read that verse as we read it. If you are there and you have made up your mind, find a way to the front. Acts chapter 26, verse number 18. Oh, yeah. To open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sacrificed by faith that is in me. So there are certain things there. Paul was about to pray and he said, the time has come that we should turn people from the world of darkness to the world of light. That they should receive the forgiveness of their sins. And that we present them in a way that they are also counted in the inheritance of God, in the inheritance of the kingdom of God, uh, that they may walk in the light and in the power of that light, that they may be sure they are safe and indeed they shall be safe. And as we shall pray, uh, may God uh, indeed change your life. As I will pray with my dear sister here, and if there is anyone there, we still feel the need, even when I pray, you may come up front that also can pray with you. Shall we close our eyes? Shall we pray? Our kind and loving Father, this evening, we are so grateful and thankful to be in your presence, to be allowed to hear your voice speak to us your word explained and interpreted in our ears that we may be able to make a difference between the things of God and the, those things that do not belong to God. Lord, do I pray even this evening calling upon your presence in our midst that without the shade blood there is no remission of sins. Lord, I pray that even now, here is my dear sister, whom I bring to your attention in her weakness to your power, in her ignorance to your wisdom, in her blindness to the light that shineth right into the heart and the mind. I pray, Lord, that she may be transferred from the powers of darkness right into the power of Christ, into the light of Jesus Christ. Lord, may you receive here into life. May you receive here into kingdom. May you allow your Holy Spirit to descend upon you. And I know not you alone, but many of us. Lord, as I pray, 
May you take it out of the powers of evil and allow it to walk in energy and in power. In the power of the Holy Spirit. Allow your eyes to see only the things of God, not the things of the devil. May the security that comes from you be sure around your life, every day of your life, as she comes in and comes out. Lord, as I pray, may she receive the forgiveness of the sins the committed and the omitted. Lord, as I pray, may that angel assigned to the faithful ones, those who love Jesus, even to keep his commandments, to walk on his dictates, on his word, may that angel be assigned a life even today. I'm sure where she sleeps, where she lives, where she works, her friends and the relatives, may they enjoy her in their presence as the daughter of the living God. As I pray, we want to command even the devil to come out not only of her, but of all of us who in the fear to present themselves before you, that have come to hear your word in your temple. Lord, I pray, may this place be therefore sanctified by your presence, be sprinkled by your blood. And Lord, may it be set apart that every feet, every mind, every heart that herefore is standing before you may be counted worthy and worthy and the daughter, the son in your kingdom. Thank you for many things. Thank you for filling the promises of the sure end that Jesus shall come and save the sin. That God loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believe in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Lord, we thank you for this eternal life in Jesus. We of ourselves we can do nothing but we want to fall not into the hands of men, into the wisdom of men, into the counsels and advices of men. Lord, we want to fall right into your hand. As I pray, even those with some occult uh, material will destroy this in your name and allow your children to live safely and be safe in your hand. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.